okay uh, we'll start with uh, resistance of high speed traps how it changes with as the speed increases we have seen that uh, at about a speed of uh, point, uh, 0.357 you get uh, third hump by a simple calculation which may not be exactly 357 but we'll linear about that and we have seen that as the speed increases further as you go to 0.4 or so the speed for the wave resistance forms a barrier the resistance becomes so much that you cannot overcome it in displacement mode and go further what happens let's look at the wave making of a ship we have seen that at low speed there may be a number of waves transverse waves these are the transverse wave humps right as the speed increases the wave length increases and you may get a speed at which wavelength is equal to ship length this should normally occur about this 0.357 uh, fruit number or there about and then if you still increase the speed and the wave will become bigger the wavelength transverse wavelength will become bigger than the ship length and it will become like this that means there is only one bow wave what is the effect what is happening here you see there is high pressure here and low pressure here because of the trough buoyancy is very little in the offside if you remember the conventional stern of a ship the buoyancy as the draft reduces at the stern the buoyancy reduces drastically but the weight is there so the vessel would sink the stern would like to squat. So, what will happen to the vessel is vessel will go like this. Do you understand what I am saying? The vessel will trim by stern, the stern will keep going down. So, that so the drag will increase tremendously because the vessel is not designed with a aft trim. Do you understand that? The vessel will sink and trim heavily by aft. So, physically this is what will happen. You might have noticed that even in uh, normal merchant ships of high speed type such as LPGs and passenger vessels if you have moved, if they go at high speed a fruit number of about 0.35 or so, you will find there is a squat on the stern side. So, the vessel starts sinking at the stern and it is unable to climb up anymore. So, as if the vessel is facing a barrier and it cannot come out of it. So, what we do to reduce this effect as the speed increases not beyond 0.4, but even towards 0.4, we try to make the stern fuller at the lower level so that even if it squats is there is still adequate buoyancy available at the stern so stern starts becoming fuller you if you remember the normal merchant ship forms we like to close the stern smoothly but here is the case when we want to make the stern fuller so slowly we go for providing a transom stern right till the bottom unlike the ships where you provide a transom stern only more or less near the weighted uh, near the free surface closing it at the free surface here underwater portion we like to make it fuller so that we get some buoyancy at least so that the squat can be controlled and as the speed increases in round bottom forms round bottom means vessels cross section of which is round round okay these are the round bottom boats the stern starts becoming fuller and as the speed increases further and further 
because of the flatness of the bottom you start getting lift do you get what i am saying so as the speed goes beyond 0.4 more or less around 0.4 is the limit which you cannot cross in purely displacement mode so if you try to move a vessel at higher and higher speed with certain flat bottom coming up certain flatness in the aft side of the vessel coming up because aft is trimming now then the vessel start experiencing lift at the second half of the portion not the first not at the forward side but on the aft side so there is a lift force coming on the aft side which will give a slight trim to the forward that is it will try to balance the trim by which the stern has started sitting am i clear so the vessel will adjust the trim to have a very low trim by aft typically about 3 4 5 degrees so that the angle of attack we have seen the angle of attack, the vessel is moving this way the water is coming like lift we have seen in last class only so that small angle of trim is essential 3 4 5 6 degrees so that the way the water comes and it generates a vertical lift so that is how the vessel starts rising okay now in a round bottom boat what else happens let's look at the water plane of such a boat somewhere near the water line water plane we have closed like this we have now increased the area here so this water line will become something like this am i understood yes. now there is a curvature starting from somewhere here and going all across till here so as the water starts flowing past we have seen there will be starting of eddies here because of the large curvature there will be large separation coming up starting from somewhere near the aft till the complete aft am i understood so you have a large drag increase due to separation you get lift but lift is limited to the flatness of the bottom uh, because the vessel is rounding up you don't get the lift due to the complete uh, breadth of the ship that is immersed because it is rounding up so you get some lift the vessel starts rising but the drag severely increases as you increase speed because there is a separation over a long distance long separation starting from somewhere in the aft region till the complete aft so what is the next step if i still want to go further i want to increase speed further i must generate more lift and i must try to reduce drag so to do this the next step is if i can have a water plane which is like this then what happens or even like this flat there is no curvature coming up here so there is no separation here the water will flow nicely here to the boundary layer but suddenly there will be a drop here so there will be large separation coming up here do you understand so what i would do what i have done in this process is i have reduced this zone of separation to a very well defined separation point all separation will take place at the transom only there will be no separation before, before that or forward of that so if i want to generate more lift i require to provide you look at the bottom section now i require to provide more flat area and therefore my vessel will come down like this if i can avoid a curvature here then i get more flat area which will give me more lifting surface therefore more lift and the transom i'll make like a transom the stern i'll make like a transom and this also will come and cut like this now ultimately you have a section shape which has a chine line and a sharp uh, 
section shape with a line of discontinuity which is called a chain line. I will show you the diagram here. But for the propeller part, where we have to come back? I will come to propeller a little later. Okay. Now you see the round bottom boat is the one on top. You can see the sections all the sections are rounded. The forward sections are more or less V shaped sections which are good from sea keeping characteristics point of view and these sections will anyway come out as the boat planes the forward portion will come out or slightly come out. They will not come out completely in round, round bottom boat because round bottom bo boats are uh, uh, semi planing. They will not plane fully. So, the forward end will still be in water, therefore it has to be designed for better sea keeping characteristics. So, you can see they are very nicely V form which is good from sea keeping is like providing like a knife edge which is entering into the sea and the aft portion you see the flatness of the bottom is coming up, but still it is not ideal and that pink portion you can see is the transom in a round round bottom boat. So, it has crossed the speed barrier, lift has been generated, but it is not in fully planing region. It is what we normally call round bottom boats are used in semi planing or semi displacement mode. Is that clear how it works? Now, in a round in a fully planing boat on the other hand you see what we have done. The sections are all having this chain line. Can you see the chain line in blue in the forward portion? You can, I hope. The forward sections will look like this, and aft sections may look something like this. This is the chain line. So, if I draw the profile of a planing boat, I will have a chain line which will go like this in the profile view that is this point and this point. Okay. So, why this chain is important apart from giving lift also? There is another uh, um, important characteristics of this. You see the water we have seen does not move only in longitudinal direction, it also moves transversely. So, when the water comes up here, it will not climb up if the speed is high, it will break here. So, similarly what I did at the transom, I do on the sides that there is clean separation here unlike a round bottom boat. On the other hand, if I had a round bottom boat here, if I had a round bottom boat here, I would have separation in all this region. So, I am trying forcibly to throw the water out at this place. In a planing boat, I am trying to forcibly throw, throw the water out even if the water plane was here. I am trying to forcibly throw the, throw the water out. Water should not climb up, that is one of the design considerations of a planning boat. I can aid this process starting from the forward end if I can provide small strips here. If I provide small strips, the water will start being thrown out here, but some water will climb up, this will thrown out here and ultimately all the water will be thrown out here. This can go right from the forward side from the immersion point till quite aft. These are called spray strips. Yes, the purpose is to throw the water out so that it does not continue the separation of flow all along the length of the ship. As we 
optimize the flowing out of the water, uh, throwing out of the water by providing spray strips and providing this chain line here and here we get better and better performance. And then the planing board can really plane, the weight can be supported by a large amount of uh, lift and small amount of displacement. Displacement is essential, you cannot avoid, you cannot have a boat which works on 100 percent lift, that is not possible in a planing boat because unless the boat is in contact with water, you do not get the lift. Is that clear? So, I have already told you why we are giving a V-shaped section in the aft, primarily to see that some buoyancy is there, some volume of displacement is there as well as we have slightly better uh, uh, course stability. If you had a completely flat bottom, then your course stability would be a problem, you have to provide skegs. If you have a V bottom, maybe you can avoid a skeg. Now, what are the parameters on which this planning phenomenon depends? You can understand that the trim in the planning mode is a very important parameter in generating lift. Trim means the vessel bottom's orientation with regard to steel water line. We have seen that a small angle gives large trim. We would like to limit the trim angle to between 3 to 5 degrees, not more than that, not less than that. Less than that will reduce trim and reduce lift and more than that may cause further separation and stall. So, we do not want that. The, the stern sitting down we do not want, but we want a little trim. So, 3 to 5 degrees trim is an ideal condition for planing boats and trim as you know will depend on the moments due to vertical forces. What are the vertical forces? One is weight acting at the LCG of the boat, weight acts as the original center of gravity, then lift which is generated and dip the at, at its centroid which is somewhere between the midship, mid boat and the aft position depending on the geometry of the bottom okay? and buoyancy. Buoyancy, if we know the uh, water level in uh, uh, planning position, we can calculate what will be the buoyancy generator and its centroid. So, these three forces, typically the weight may act somewhere here, lift may act somewhere here and buoyancy also may act somewhere here. So, this is trying to lift and trim the vessel this way and this is trying to trim the vessel this way. So, there will be a balance between, the trim will be a balance between the moments of the three forces, lift, buoyancy and weight, right. Lift and buoyancy will depend on the geometry design of the boat, but weight on the other hand will depend on weight distribution. If these are not controlled, then your vessel's uh, planning characteristics will be totally bad. Therefore, these boats are very weight sensitive boats with regard to their distribution. Even if you copy a design from somewhere else, if you cannot control weight, the same boat will not give you planning, which has happened in many of the uh, planning boat manufacturers when they do not understand this very important factor. They get a design from somewhere else, the hull form, they manufacture it put all the weights, but they have not taken control of it and it just does not play. This happens. Okay. Propulsion of these boats, how do you propel these boats? Invariably, if this is the boat, then I will have an engine which will bring down the propeller here. This is one way of propelling the vessel. The other way is if this is my water line. The other way is if I can bring the stern up by somewhat designing it such a manner that my stern can come up, then I can give a propeller here. Alternative, 
So fitment of propeller will depend on how much of water depth is available with you. Of course, you can always have uh, a third alternative, a podded propeller. Yeah, completely behind. But here one has to be careful that you see this is the position where all the separated flow is taking place at the stern. So if your propeller is not separated from this kind of flow by a small distance, then it is likely to not only not generate the thrust, but may cause a large vibration. So you have to be careful about this. So these are the conventional propulsion methods. The new ones are what is called water jet propulsion. That is, if I push water, take water from front and push it behind, the momentum will move the ship forward. But for a pro water jet propulsion, therefore, I have to design a pump, a pump which will cause a pressure difference on both sides so that the water can be pushed, pulled from one side from behind the from somewhere here and thrown out here. So a water jet propulsion invariably consists of a designing of a pipeline and a pump inside it and uh, the throw process. Advantage with water jet propulsion is that if you can orient that pump and pipe, uh, uh, if it can be mounted on a swivel kind of thing then that pump itself can act as a steering device. You do not require a uh, steering device anymore. So what is it propulsions are normally designed that way that they can serve the purpose of steering as well as propulsion. But most people still feel comfortable with propellers. The efficiency levels are more or less same. Maybe propellers will have slightly higher efficiency than water jets, but then there are good water jet designs which give as good uh, performance. Do you use a single jet or always double jet? We normally use, uh, you can have single jet or double jet. Normally if you have a twin a twin system, then you have two jets. If you have a single centralized system, you have a single jet. But in these boats, normally two engines are provided because uh, the engines themselves can maneuver the ship. One stop, one yeah, we can turn. Okay. Uh, the other thing about planning boards is its sea keeping characteristics. I have mentioned this to you. We can definitely design the forebody with a very extreme V-shaped sections, which will behave like a knife edge when the vessel moves. And therefore, even if the waves are coming, it can cut through the waves and take the boat. But it is not so simple because your lifting characteristics are dependent on the surface phenomenon. So if a wave comes and immerses more water at one point, your lift characteristics will change. Plus, since the vessel has very little immersion, the vessel is likely to oscillate more. So planing boards generally have, whether single hull planing boards or catamaran planing holes, generally have bad sea keeping characteristics with regard to heave and pitch. If you have a twin cat catamaran type of planing hull, it may be better from stability, but roll is, roll can be quite high. So since the rotational motion magnitudes are high, the farthest you are from the center line of axis of rotation, the higher will be your linear acceleration due to rotational acceleration. If the angle is phi here and you are far away from the point of, of, of rotational axis, there the displacement will be high at a higher rate, therefore the acceleration will be high. So generally these boats are uncomfortable. So before you get on a planning boat, you must be prepared that you are going to get large motions, particularly if the boat is going at whip force scale 3 and above. It's surprising. What I say, may, you may find it surprising, but it is true. Whenever people go on planning boats, they don't fall more seasick than boats which do not have this motion. 
see sea sickness is basically a function of acceleration at the point where you are standing linear acceleration where you are standing though i have said planning boards ex experience more uh, acceleration it would normally follow that more people should be seasick but normally this doesn't happen a lot of planning boards moving all over the world why does it not happen because basically people are mentally prepared that you are going at high speed and you are likely to experience some motions consciously or unconsciously people are prepared to withstand some amount of motion but that doesn't mean that you increase the speed of the boats because beyond a certain acceleration anywhere nobody can experience uh, withstand it so if you want to move a planning boat at higher speed definitely comfort will be a casualty so if you have to move the boat it must be for reasons other than a comfortable right that is for military purposes or for customs or something like that you can move the boat i have also covered uh, planning catamarans in this process now let's go and see what happens in a hydrofoil in a hydrofoil we have seen that the foil is the one that uh, gives the lift we have seen that foils can be either symmetrical or camber yesterday we have seen this okay is a little exaggerated camber right we have seen that a camber foil gives better lift at small angles of inclination that's why camber foils are used you can generate camber a variable camber by not having a single foil but foil in two pieces for example you can have I have foil in two pieces like this, which is symmetrical, and this last piece can be rotated. To two sides, to a certain angle. Now, if you look at this, this changes now the shape, depending on the length. I have given only a very small length, but you can go up to this length. then you can actually change the camber of the aerofoil if you change the camber of the aerofoil then the lift characteristics change it can become more or it you can also reduce it by change changing the foil direction why is this used i mentioned to you like in uh, planning boat in hydrofoil boats you generate a large amount of lift and perhaps no buoyancy so generally hydrofoils are fitted with a forward foil and a aft foil suppose the boat is like this you have forward foil here and a set of aft foils here we have seen in the diagrams forward foil and aft foil so you have lift coming up at two places and weight is acting somewhere in the center now when in uh, your design should be such that in stable equ equilibrium position the weight and lift should balance each other that the lift uh, the trim is suitable for the foil to operate and give you that lift you are getting my point any foil whether it's a planing boat bottom or a hydrofoil the lift that you will generate will largely depend on the angle of attack therefore you must be very careful that you get the correct angle of attack so this lifts of forward foil and aft foil and the weight will determine what sort of trim you will get that trim may be acceptable and good from at the design stage you determine and the vessel moves but now there are waves when there are waves the 
wave forces will change the behavior of the foils and the vessel will start oscillating. Do you understand that? And when it starts oscillating, what do you do? One of the reasons you wanted foil, foil uh, bound vessels is that it should go smoothly in the waves, but now that is not possible. So, it will oscillate. So, to control the oscillation, you could have these uh, flap foil, foils with flaps, which can control the camber of the foil and therefore control the lift that is being generated. So, the vessel can, through a very com uh, complex control mechanism, having sensors everywhere and measuring the acceleration forward and aft, this control of the foils can be made so that uh, your vessel is stable. The other way, this is one way, the other way is increase the surface, uh, wetted surface, uh, sorry, not sur water plane surface, so that you can control, just by having the control, uh, having the water plane, this thing, the motion is reduced and therefore, you need not have controls on the foil. So, you have these two types of foils, I have mentioned this earlier also. They are the completely immersed foils, you can have like this or have one foil from one end to another end. Okay. And this is your water plane. In this case, these foils will have, will be based on uh, this thing, um, controls. These are the typical American hydrofoils, American Navy's hydrofoils, which have controls on the flaps themselves, but the flaps have to have automatic control. You cannot have manual control and expect that your vessel will remain uh, steady. The other alternative is the so called surface piercing foils, where you have this, this is your water plane and you have the foils right like this. So, you have this surface piercing area coming up here, these struts are there. So, you have more area on the water surface, so the disturbances due to waves etcetera can be minimized. Also, it gives adequate transfer stability. Transfer stability is very important for a, a hydrofoil, because you are giving at high speed, you have hardly any time to control in the event of something happening, uh, a wind blowing or something like that. So, you must have adequate uh, transfer stability, so that the vessels can go. So, in either way, you can see that the sea keeping characteristics of such a vessel is much better than that of a catamaran, sorry, that of a planing hull. You can have um, catamaran hydrofoils. In fact, uh, you know what is called a foil cat foil cat, foil catamarans, it's and our foils here. So, you can have many combinations or you can have foils coming down also. If you, you can have foils here, where you have small immersion of the hull, giving you the effect of surface piercing. Also, you can bring down the foils, so that the entire thing can come up, you can have narrow hulls here, which will be advantageous for low speed condition. See, you see, uh, you have to understand that uh, mm, uh, whatever high speed you are talking of, the vessel has go through the low speed region to reach that high speed. Isn't it? Same while stopping. So, if you look at the resistance characteristics of a normal monohull, it would look like small oscillations here, maybe some, some waves here, goes like this, function of speed. If you take one of these high speed craft, you cannot expect them to be a speed or we can call it uh, displacement fluid number. You cannot expect them to be as efficient as a complete displacement hull. 
in displacement mode when the lift has not been generated. So, generally their resistance will be higher in low speed range, but soon around 0 0.35 to 0 0.4 this will have a fall and it will rise only at a lesser speed because mainly because the wave resistance has vanished. There is no wave making resistance anymore at high speed. Whether it is come out of water or even in a planing board, there is no wave making resistance anymore because the wave has been left behind, it is far away. Okay. So, let us see some of the diagrams that I have. This is the hull shape I have already described to you. If I compare the hard chain forms with round bottom forms, you can see hard chain forms will give high lift and round bottom boats will not give you so high a lift. Hard chain boats will reduce resistance and round bottom boats will have higher resistance. Hard chain boats will have high vertical acceleration and round bottom boats will have lower acceleration hence better ride comfort. Hard chain will be superior for a fruit number displacement fruit number of 2.25, but normally you use hard chain much earlier than this. Double chain can be a compromise. What is a double chain? Compromise between a uh, single chain and double chain. This is a single chain boat. This is called a chain line. Okay. A double chain boat is two chains, which you can say is a compromise between single chain and a round bottom form. Sometimes this is used for other purposes than purely hydrodynamic. Displacement high speed crafts are generally close to conventional craft going to round bottom boats and designing this one can benefit from experience. Understand that high speed boats which are not displacement type our experience is limited. Planning craft can achieve high speed, loads and stability need attention, loads means what loads are we talking about? In a planning boat, what loads are coming into picture? After all, it is a we have always said the weight sensitive weights are known, there is no buoyancy. So, what is the load we are talking about? When the planning boat goes, there is a point of contact between water and hull bottom at a particular point somewhere near the midship, and this point is always oscillating. Do you understand? That means, if we reduce speed a little bit it comes down, if the speed goes up it goes up. So, in this portion particularly the portion which is near the contact of water in uh, its optimum condition is prone to uh, slamming because a flat bottom we have said a flat bottom. So, there is large pressure coming up there, there is plenty of literature on this subject, large pressure development is there and the vessel experiences slamming at that place. Therefore, that portion has to be designed very strongly. So, that is why the loads have to need attention. Other types of high speed craft, they have to be examined. See planning boats, lot of literature is there. You cannot use the same uh, technique for other high speed craft because the uh, hydrodynamic behavior is completely different from that of planning. So, while designing a high speed craft you have to remember why you are doing it. As I said you cannot in general say that all high speed crafts will be uh, comfortable. Planning boats will have their limitation. To achieve high speed uh, you have to remember the goal of course, cost effectiveness if not a goal. If it is not a goal then put it as a goal because ultimately whenever you are building a high speed craft whether military or otherwise everybody will say uh, what is the cost, 
not only the building cost but what is the fuel consumption we are talking 5000 6000 kilowatts of power in a small boat somebody has to justify why so much of oil has to be burnt and perhaps it's a gas turbine it's aviation fuel concepts are combined hybrid craft scope for innovation is very high in this design parameters need attention okay before going to conclusion i think i will go back to some more slides this we have seen just go over uh, the slides no where is it gone? this also we have seen this we have seen okay from here onwards talk to you this is the resistance curve you can see the top one is for a displacement hull and the bottom one is conventional hull versus high speed craft the one that i have already drawn to you on the paper so you get a distinct advantage of going over to high speed if you are going for a sprut number above 0.52 so normally above 0.4 or so we say high speed but ab above 0.52 you start getting the advantage the wavelength we have discussed this i have given it to you in class that the wavelength of a transverse wave will be 2 pi v square by g and based on that you can see that when wavelength to at about 0.399 the wavelength equal to ship length we set that as 0.4 okay and wavelength equal to half of, uh, the wavelength is five times the ship length when fruit number is 0.892 you see what's happening to the stern it's coming up but it will sit now to to combat that the stern will sink so the vessel will have a high trim Let's see what is there. Huh? Okay, this all we have gone through. I'm just uh, going through again. Uh, in high-speed craft, single hull is single hull vessels. Weight is supported by buoyancy. Special hull forms for high speed and good sea keeping. Advanced technologies to reduce weight. What is the advanced technology we use for reducing weight? main thing is materials should be going for aluminum or fiber reinforced, reinforced uh, plastics no titanium is not used in uh, surface vessels and uh, that much of strength requirement is not there you see one thing you have to understand strength may be very high but you cannot reduce the thickness uh, to in that proportion suppose titanium is four times stronger than steel i cannot use Instead of a 5 millimeter plate, I can't mean use a 1 millimeter plate. Okay, there is a workability limitation is there apart from corrosion and other things. And other problems that come up with titanium. Stress corrosion, cracking and all those things will come. So you cannot reduce thickness to a very small level. So you don't get the benefit of high strength. Whereas you should go for lighter material. That is why we prefer aluminum and uh, fiber reinforced plastic uh, applications widely used for commercial and military which you have said already merits of displacement drive craft why do i use displacement craft high transport efficiency that is understood 
because of the optimal fuel consumption basically. Small propulsion power and high endurance, you can have large amount of fuel to for a large route length. Ruggedness and simplicity because of experience I suppose mainly, uh, tolerance to growth, existing infrastructure for construction, operation and maintenance can be used and low cost. Then planing craft, flat stem, flat stern to limit sinkage and trim, we have discussed this, fine entrance for low resistance and good sea keeping, v, v shape sections we have mentioned. At high speeds, hydrodynamic pressures begin to lift hull which skims on water surface, hull planes. Spray is generated, there is a large amount of spray in this because of the uh, separation at the sides and at the end round bottom or chine form, spray strips, double chine forms, all this I have discussed. Okay. I think we have gone through all the slides and general comments we have seen. We can now go to the concluding slides. This also we have seen. What do we conclude from these two hours? The, there are various types of high speed craft use some combinations of displacement, air cushion, lift and also hybrid cushions, hi, hi, hybrid consider combining uh, two or three hydrodynamic phenomena or lift phenomena. But basically all high speed craft use vertical lift and reduce the uh, hydro, hydrostatic lift. Design considerations must take into account merits and drawbacks of the concepts. This is very important. You cannot blindly use that I want 50 knots, so let me use any one of these. You have other considerations which are necessary for you to consider which one will be the most suitable. Okay, that is the, those are the two main conclusions we get from this chapter that uh, um, how you generate the lift to lift the vessel out of water and the other one is for designing you have to consider the other types of behavior apart from drag. Drag alone is not considered uh, sufficient, you have to look at propulsion, how you fit a propeller, the power plant, the materials used, the loads coming on the vessel and its com ride comfort. The other things which you must consider for designing a, deciding on a high speed craft and later on perhaps designing and manufacturing one. Any questions? Okay then, thank you gentlemen. sense of academics which is ensured by a strict selection process, life at Kharagpur is a celebration of, well, life. And at its heart are the students. In fact, the saying goes that you can take an IITN out of KGP, but not KGP out of an IITN. You've left a part of you behind. For most of the students, life in the campus was in itself a festivity, a collage of activities that shape their mind and body, 
a collage of events that was a synthesis of competition and cooperation. A collage of interests as diverse as dramatics and ham radio. Yes, life at Kharagpur has always been exciting. And the years cemented lifelong bonds as lives mingled over cups of joy and stretched over stimulating semesters. The halls with their blocks and wings connected by charming catwalks remain ensconced in their own world. A collage of memories infrastructurally adequate, architecturally meticulate, and holistically inspiring. Where students, wherever they might be from, invariably come into their own, developing their individual talents, honing their skills to take on challenges with confidence so they can move ahead in fulfilling their dreams. What makes IIT Kharagpur so unique is its environment. Undiluted by the diversions of metropolitan surroundings, the close-knit campus life enhances the entrepreneurial and innovative spirit of the achievers-to-be. In an environment that is so stimulating, it is only natural that down the years, IIT Kharagpur has consistently produced well-rounded individuals. Many of them are celebrities in their own right. Holistic grooming has had a lot to do with this. So, no matter which walk of life they choose, the IIT KGPI stands tall. And so does the institution that bred him in majestic splendor. The alumni of this institute command global respect. Their distinguished presence at the helm of global giants is a matter of national pride. For the students of IIT Kharagpur, it is impossible to erase any scratch of memory about their alma mater. In fact, some come back to invest sentiment, pride and money. To see the institute they call home rise to even greater heights, structurally, functionally as well as holistically. Their singular aim is to make IIT Kharagpur an institute whichever way you look at it par excellence. A man's journey into quiet accomplishment and the Hall of Fame starts with the right step. And the training and placement cell of IIT has been the efficient facilitator in this regard for over 30,000 graduates. Having placed more than 95% of its students in a wide range of industries consistently for over two decades, it is no wonder that the institute is the most preferred campus for technical recruitment of quality manpower. With infrastructure like industrial power and communication facilities, in addition to its excellent research and consultancy facilities, STEP, or Science and Technology Entrepreneurs Park, aims to assist the budding entrepreneur into a successful adventure capitalist, guiding him right from the concept, institutional financing, production, leading up to the launch and marketing of the product. With its rich pool of talent and excellent infrastructure, it is no surprise that through the last three decades, IIT Kharagpur has developed strong liaison with the industry, 
SRIC, or Sponsored Research and Industrial Consultancy Cell, was formalized as the Special Industry Interaction Cell in 1982. Devoted full-time to handle industrial projects and consultancies, and for deploying and propagating intellectual property. Successful sponsored research projects straddle a wide spectrum ranging from computers, communication and biotechnology, to robotics, photonics, and food processing. The setting up of a state-of-the-art VLSI CAD laboratory and tie-ups with GE in areas ranging from vehicle structure design to electrical communication and software technologies are excellent examples of IIT Kharagpur's ever-evolving pioneering spirit. Collaborations with a host of national and industrial majors are a testimony of its proven expertise and research repertoire. celebration continues, Pandit Nehru would surely have been a proud man today. For him, IIT Kharagpur was always more than just an institute of technology. In his own immortal words, it is indeed a fine monument of modern India. <laughs> <laughs> 